Good morning. You can turn with me to Acts chapter 17, or you can take out your message notes and do, or do both. Actually, I prefer you do both. There you go. So, it's good to be with you this morning. And, um, oh, let me get that up. Let's see if we can fix this from last week. Can you hit from the beginning? There we go. Remember last week, that whole... Thanks to Mario coming over to me telling me what to do. I figured it out. Thank you. I listened to you. <laughs> so, but, um, hey guys, I'm just going to begin with the prayer. We're going to dive on in. Um, oh, hi. It's good to see you guys. It's been a long day. It's been a long night. And so I'm going to dive in and let God guide us in all this, all right? Let's go. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you. We bless you, Father, because you give us life and breath. God, you guide us, you protect us. Lord, you're our teacher. You're our savior. God, you are everything that we are not, and yet you don't treat us as our sins deserve. We are so grateful for what you have given us in faith in Christ and the examples from Father, the the patriarchs to to the apostles and to all those who have lived out the faith to the very end. And we wish to be, for the future generations, what they were to us. We live in a complex world. It's difficult at times. And more often than not, we, we're not sure what direction to take. But then, God, we come to our senses. We look at your scriptures. We see the example, both in action and in speech. And things then become clear to us. And I pray, God, that we kind of have that clarity today. That you really kind of remove the veil from our eyes so that we can see clearly. Lord, and when we do so, may you show your glory through us. So all may praise you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I'm going to begin a series for the next few Sundays called Athens in America. And we think of Athens. Um, today, this is how it's going to work. All right? That's right. I haven't had much sleep. I drove back from Connecticut in a snowstorm, and you know, the, the, the figurative speech of white knuckling it, that, that exists, okay? Uh, 30 to 40 miles an hour all the way from middle Connecticut to the turnpike of Jersey before I can put a little pep in this step, you know? Uh, so we got back last night, and uh, we were on a funeral in Connecticut, and so uh, I woke up this morning, and I go, I hate that alarm. Uh, the kids had wrestling, and of course we had service, so here we are. And then afterwards, guys, uh, the birds, we had to go down to Maryland, uh, PA staff retreat, where all the, the PA leaders and churches come together. And um, So we are going to be heading right out and be back Tuesday. So, uh, so what I like to do here is have you participate a little bit in all this, okay? So get your thinking caps on, but I won't make it too hard, all right, because I know that would exhaust you. And you're not used to coming in saying, you know, you, you know, you're used to coming in listening rather than having to answer a lot of questions. So here we go. When you think of Athens, what did they contribute to us in the West? Olympics. Olympics. That's true. They did. Okay. There's Olympics. Education. Education, right? Democracy. Democracy. Okay. Philosophy, Philosophy right? You got the either or thinking, okay? Philosophy, anything else? What? Mythology? Yeah. Just throw it out there. I can't hear half of you, so go ahead. I, you know, <laughs> you're not getting graded on it. It's all right to me, man. <laughs> so good. Yeah, a lot of those things are, are, are really still with us to this very day. And, you know, I think about during this time that, uh, that uh, the book of Acts is being written, we know that the power who controlled the world at that time was Rome. And so Rome conquered territories, but Athens conquered the hearts of everyone. Rome might have had the land masses and control through might and fear. They may have built the roads, right? They might have been incredible engineers. But really, who owned the hearts, even in Rome, were the Athenians and their way of life and thinking. Hellenism. 
Man was the center. And gods served the man. Where in the rest of history, man served the gods. And so we'll look because we're still living under the influence of the Hellenistic thinking and living. And so it'd be great just to go through the, some of the things in the book of Acts and say, well, how do we communicate to this world? You know, I, I realize uh, many of you have already gone through raising children that are now on their own. And some of us are beginning, we're in the beginning stages. And all those stages, right, it's learning how to communicate to be unified with them. Right? There's nothing more frustrating when you got a newborn baby who keeps crying and you go, I don't know what is wrong with this kid. Right? I gave them the gas medicine. I gave them the teething medicine. I gave them to mom. I fed her. You know, I fed him. You know, I did all those things. And it doesn't work. Right? And that's a frustrating thing. And then you got to move on and you're trying to teach and train and, and learn to grow together. And then you get to those teen years, right? I'm just beginning of those teen years. It's been good so far. But, you know, it's, I, I, I seen, okay? I seen. And I went through it. I was that teen. And my parents just did not understand me. Right? They were no longer my heroes. They're no longer that smart. They just didn't know. They don't get it. The modern times, right? <laughs> It's not like that anymore, as I get told. We're not in the 1900s anymore. <laughs> it's, just, it's like 20 years ago, right? You don't know. So it happens, right? And, you know, and so you're learning once again how to connect, how to communicate your message, your experience, right? The things that you have gone through in life to this next generation. And you just hope that somehow, some way, it stays. You may rebel from it now, but man, the prayer is that later on they come and they realize, you know, mom and dad weren't that dumb. Okay? Mom and dad knew what they were saying. And it's going to happen whether my daughter wants it or not. Okay? Because I look back, I go, wow, my mom knew what she was talking about. Okay? They get it. So, stay in the course. All right? That's what I get told. Stay the course. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about my kids. I'm taking this concept and saying, how do we, we deal with a world that it seems like we're at opposite ends? We're people of faith versus people who don't believe. Okay? Well, you got many different faiths. And really, the outline that I want to talk about today, that the outline, no matter what we talk to, really doesn't change. That we might think it has to, it really doesn't have to. And so this is a lesson I gave last Saturday, and um, I want to begin this series with this lesson again this Sunday. And uh, I, you know, I, I know we did it as a Bible talk, so those folks who have already heard some of this, you get to hear it again, and uh, I'm very happy for you. So. <laughs> but when you look at this, we're going to begin with Acts 17, verse 16. I thought I was there, and apparently I wasn't. Are you ready? It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed. A little bit of an understatement. It actually has a stronger word. I mean, he was so disturbed from the gut. It, it's almost sickening what he was seeing. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. In Athens, they had Zeus, the creator of all things, Right? Athena, she was also there in the Parthenon and everything else, a source of wisdom and truth. You had uh, idols of the gods that healed, and you had, you had uh, idols of the, or uh, statues of the Roman emperor who was the, the savior in the world, right? And there he is just walking around, and he's seeing all these idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both the Jews and the god feeling Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with them. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, 
He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is about who you are, what you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. See, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Idols. Uh, idling, right? Paul then stood up in the meaning of the, the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walk around, around and look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. All right, I just want to pause there. You got your notes, you can see. You know, in this small group of society, Paul is addressing all the type of people that we still address today. Okay? You got the religious peoples. There's altars all around. You know, when I was driving on the way here to church today, I've driven by many churches. I've driven down by Sikh temples and Hindu temples and mosque, all these different religion groups all around. And we live in an, er in an area where there's a plethora of just different types of religion and their beliefs. And you go, how do I communicate to such a vast group of people? There's the Stoic, and they're the reason lovers. They're the philosophers, they're the educated, the brightest of their kind. Who would they be today? Who would you consider the Stoics? I know you say people don't feel, right? They control their emotions. But think about this a little bit more. They're the bright, they're the, the most educated, okay? Where do we find these type of people? Who would they be in our world? Scientists, Scientists right? Universities. Politicians. Politicians. Some of them. <laughs> I'm not sure all of them. Right? But I'm not here to criticize them. I'll let you do that. Okay. So, uh, but think about it. Yeah, there's some of our, our top leaders, right? Our, our educators, our scientists, right? Our philosophers. They exist. How do we reach this society? How do we bring truth to them? Oh, God. The yeah, Epicureans, they're all about pleasure seekers. Get that fun now. If it feels good, it must be right. How do we, what do we call them today? Entertainers. Entertainers, right? That's a good one. They think they're the philosophers. I mean, in some ways they are, but, you know, you got the, the entertainers. Who else? YouTubers. YouTubers? <laughs> Who's that, sister? Where's my son? You hear that? YouTubers. Uh, pleasure seekers, right? Gamers, maybe. Right? What else? You got something? A whole generation of the youth, maybe. I don't know. And adults, right? I, look at, I, I know this is being filmed. I, I gotta be careful, man. You know, but I know some adults that are out about having just a good time right now. Yeah. All right. But we have those in our society. What message do we get to them? The babblers, right? The babblers is a term that was given by the Athenians and, and the Greeks. For, uh, it was a term used for chickens. <laughs> What I mean is, you know, a chicken would eat a little bit here, peck a little here, and eat a little here, and eat a little here. And, and that's sort of how their philosophy was. They took a little bit from here, they took a little bit from here, and they took a little bit from here. And they had this smorgasbord of uh, ideas and belief systems. <coughs> None of it really was coherent in the beginning. And when you start really questioning it, it all falls apart really quickly because there's, there's no continuity in it, right? And they just battle They just take a bunch of theories and put it together, whatever best fits their needs. We have some babblers today, right? That's no difference, isn't there? The Areopagus, well, that was the Supreme Court of Athens. And they control religious thought and speech and philosophical thoughts and speech of its day. Okay? So a new teaching or whatnot came in. They, they had to go before the, the Supreme Court of Athens. And they would judge whether or not that is politically correct to be in their society. Do we have that today? 
man, you say the wrong thing, you're not even realizing you're crucified. Okay? A person can lose their whole career by a slip of a word or not accepting a certain theory or belief or an action in society. And that'd be the Areopagus. That exists today, right? How do we connect with that? The result of all this is this is one unknown God. And in our society, we deal with the same kind of issues. God unknown. Because of what has infiltrated throughout our communities and society. And this is the world that Paul is walking into in Athens. This is the world I believe we still exist in our lives today. Does anybody else see what I'm saying? There's not a difference. And I think that is the hard part for us to understand. We think we live in unique times. We're not unique. It's just packaged different. It's wrapped differently. But it's still the same issues that we're facing. And this is what our kids are inundated with day in and day out. And you know what? They don't even know that they're being indoctrinated. All they know is their parents are old and outdated. <laughs> but we're still cool than them. I don't care what they say. No. No. They're awesome. We do have great kids. And so I want to look at the outline that Paul does. See, Paul does something pretty remarkable for us to really learn from. First of all, Paul framed his message that he's about to give using cultural ideas and metaphors they can understand, but he used scripture to guide them. But when you read what I'm, when we're about to read what, I, what, I'm, what I'm going to read, you notice he never quotes a single scripture. He doesn't say Deuteronomy this, Exodus this, Psalms this, you know, the Hebrew Bible this. He doesn't say any of that because they would know a lick of that stuff. They wouldn't understand it. But he understood because he observed their culture, <clears throat> what they believed, and what are the metaphors would help him connect the message that God has to that generation? So he did learn how to speak their languages and use their analogies to help further explain God and his purpose in this world. And I think that's where we have to live in a world like this. Athens in America requires us to be able to communicate God's message with cultural ideas and metaphors that can be understood for that age. But it still has to be guided by the text. Amen. You can't make things up on your own or borrow it from some latest book or a great podcast or TV show. The text itself has to guide us. And so therefore we have to know our text. I was gonna. I try to get some people who can quote the memory verses, and no one was ready to do it. Amen. <laughs> Next week, right? <laughs> Wednesday, Sunday, you can do it. I don't care if it's one verse. Just let's quote it, right? We want the word in our in our hearts. We want it in our minds, always there wherever we go, because it's the text, it's the scriptures, it's God who saves. It ain't our good looks. It's not our intelligence. Okay? It ain't going to work. You're good looking. You're pretty smart. But only the Lord saves. And so let's look how he handles this. Let's continue. Does say, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. All right? The God who made the world... And everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He went right at the Zeus on that one. And does not live in temples built by human hands. Here he is in the Areopagus. And right there is the Pantheon. One of the most beautiful temples in the world of its day. Even today, people just marveled at what they were able to do. And that technology. And there are these, these temples that are built by human hands. And the reason 
they built these temples by human hands is because they wanted to take these deities to see far off and unseen and bring them close to them. And he's saying that's not where God is. God is now in us. You are the temple of God. That is so revolutionary for its time. To us, it's been around for so long. And we read the scriptures time and time again. This is just not white noise. Oh yeah, I've heard this before. But we don't understand. We live in a world that's building big temples of worship to themselves. The false gods. And God's saying, what I'm trying to build in you is a temple that will stand forever. Athens, you go there today and all you see is ruins. But in you, God resides. And you're a temple that's eternal. And so, what he begins here is, Paul was able to explain who God is. He's a creator. You remember a few weeks ago, we did the shepherd, right? The shepherd and his sheep. And what did we talk about when it came to God explaining who God is? What are some of the problems we face? Do you remember? The abstract versus the concrete, right? How'd you close your eyes, right? So think about God. How do we, when, 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 they, when they were explaining God scripturally, they use concrete analogies, right? So what are some of the ones we have? What's that? Shepherd, shepherd right? You have an idea, you close your eyes, you know what a shepherd looks like. Versus all-knowing. What, how do you, how do you express that? How do you concretely vision all-knowing, right? But a shepherd, and we know what a shepherd does. We begin to express who God is. What's another one? What? Father, Father, right? We can concretely know what a father is, and a role a father doesn't. Even if... As a, we didn't have great fathers, we understand what a good father looks like, right? Another one. Bread of life, right? Get fed by him, strengthened by him, right? We got, he's a shield, he's a fortress. These are all concrete things. These are things we can use to help express who God is. Now listen, in the Arrow of Vegas, I just want you to realize all these people are still there. He's not trying to say, well, let me see how I communicate to religious people and how should I communicate to the Stoics. He's giving them kind of one overall outline to follow. It's the same. You've got to be able to communicate who God is appropriately for this, for them to really get God. Does that make sense? And then he says, and he's not served by human hands. As if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. You exist. You live. Whether you believe God or not. Simply because God allows it. And he says, from one man he made all nations. God is the creator. That they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history. And the boundaries of their lands. You're not a mistake. You're here with purpose in mind. When God created you, He created you with purpose in mind. Not a mistake. And remember, I got below these the scriptures. This is so you can go back and see where He got these, these thoughts from. Remember, He knows His text. He's using the text to guide him. But he's explained it in a way they can understand. But he's not deviating throughout the text on all this. Explaining God by allow, using God's word to explain himself. And Paul was able with this to tell us what God does. What God does. And it's so important that we can explain what God does. You know, um, somebody asked me, what do you do as a minister? 
I gotta be honest, I had the hardest time explaining it. <laughs> Not that I don't do anything, I feel like I do a lot of things, right? So how do I battle that down? And, and, you know, and then they start to think, this guy is a phony, he doesn't really do a job, right? <laughs> I'm just like, you know, I get people, I do this, I do that. It's like, oh man, I really gotta be able to explain my job. You know, I can explain a whole lot of things, but, you know, I love how he simplifies it. Yeah. He creates, he sets the boundaries, he gives life, he gives breath. I mean, it's just simple little things that you connect with them, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that God has a job that is unexplainable. <laughs> His job is explainable. I, you know, it's like talking to some old friends of mine in, in, in the faith who, who work for the government in, in secret business, and they can't tell you exactly what they do. You go, ooh, this guy's a spook. <laughs> Push too much, you might get killed. But right? it's not like that. God got it. We can't explain it. Then, so who God is, what God does. You want to get to the heart of the Athenian in America. You've got to be able to explain and talk about who God is and what God does. And it doesn't have to be long and detailed. But you got to do it in a way that connects with the audience that you're talking to. And then he continues. From one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, right? And he marked the... Was that the one I just did? Oh. I think uh, that's a slide mess up. No? Michelle told me no, so I, I go with my wife always. So, uh, and he marked out their appointed um, times in history and boundaries of the land, right? What God cares about. God cares about man. Yeah. What he cares about is mankind. That's what's important to him. You know, I, one of the first things I do when I wake up and throughout the day, I quote what they call the Shabbat. Hear all Israel, right? The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, right? Some say strength, okay? Leviticus 19, you know, talks about 11. Love love your neighbor as yourself. Quote that often. Then I remember Jesus' commandment. John 13, what's he say? New command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this old man will know you're my disciple. I quote that over and over and over again because I want the priority and realize I need to love God. And, with, and then I need to love my neighbor as myself. And I got to love the way Jesus does. And I can't properly love God unless I love my neighbors. Amen. And I'll never be able to love my neighbors properly unless I love God. Amen. And so it's this circle that is there to work together. And it's a challenge to love. One of the hardest commandments to obey is do everything out of love. But what does God care about? People. Even the ones that are unlovable. You're like, am I one of those? <laughs> I don't, I, figure it out yourself. I, I love you all. Let's go next. <laughs> but think about this. It's what God cares about. That's what we should care about. But we have to be able to express. See, I think the, the conversation of God has been hijacked in such a way that people really, there's many people who really don't believe God is a loving God. Yeah. That he's a harsh God. But that is wrong. We have to express who God is. And God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from one of, any one of us, Right? Man, that's Jeremiah 29, thir- uh, 29, 13, isn't it? Seek the Lord and your God, right? Come on, I know the plans I have for you, yeah. to prosper you, right? But then he says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. And so this is what, I just did this one, what God cares about. He wants us to seek him, right? This is my mess up. I apologize. And let me tell you what that was supposed to be. The other one, what God does, what God cares about, and then who, who we are in relationship to him. For in him we, are, we live and move, right? In him we live and move and have our being. And some of you, of your own poets, have said 
We are his offspring. I love that he knows their, their cultural references. He understands their worships. He understands their poets and their cultural references. And he looks at it and he says, who are we to God? That God is a father, right? We mentioned that earlier. It's, it's a relationship he wishes to have. He's not far. When you think about relationship, you don't think of something distant. You don't think something that's cold. You think of something of close, meaningful, warm. And we get to communicate that, both in our words and our deeds. For we are the living temple. It's who we are. But this is Athens. And as I begin to come to an end here, it says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should do not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone as an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such, what? Ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. You know, that is a beautiful word that somehow we muddied. But repentance is a beautiful word. Return to God. Come back. It's a, it's a word of rejoicing. And, you know, you think about the scriptures, it talks about how repent for the time of refreshment may come. The sins may be wiped away. You know, I, I was holding back on this part with somebody I've been studying the Bible with. Because there was a crisis of faith with this person. We were studying for a while. And uh, there was a, a guy who you know, came in, and he had a lot of troubles in his life. And we were studying the Bible. And we're really just honing in on making the Bible the standard and discipleship and God's calling and all these things. And, and, but nothing would ever seem to go right in this person's life. I mean, it's just one bad news after another. And he said, I'm offering up prayers, and I'm offering up prayers. And truth of the matter is, he made a lot of decisions that brought that catastrophe in his own life. But he's offering up prayers, and he's offering up prayers, and nothing's heard. Nothing happens. In fact, you'd say, every time I pray, the opposite happens. And so in the middle of it, he became an atheist. Or he's like, well, I'm agnostic because I want to believe this stuff, but really, I, I don't believe. And I was like, man, I unconverted someone. How many could say that? Right? I was like, oh my gosh. I studied a Bible so many, they lose their faith. I'm horrible. So we just kept at it. And every week we'd get together and I'd just trying to get him to have faith in God again. Faith in God again. Faith in God. Come on, we walk and we, we open up the scriptures and we looked at the stories and the struggles. And man, nothing was budging. Finally, I was like, you know, today's the day. I just need to talk about sin and repentance. And I remember just being a little nervous because this had, the, this was a, this could be really tenacious. And it could really blow up in my face. And I decided I'm going to give it a go. And I remember telling Michelle, pray for this, because this can really go bad. Fast. And so I'm in the car and I'm praying, Lord, I just pray to do you well, Will. I just want to teach people their ignorance, give them light to the scriptures, and call them to make the Bible the standard and how to repent in this. So I started this Bible study. I'm going to make a long story short. But somehow, he brought up the topic. I said, this is exactly what I wanted to talk to you about. And I went in and I started looking at the forgiveness of sins that is needed. And the reason why we need forgiveness. And so I started looking at sin in our lives. And I started talking about my sin and how I had to repent. And then we started talking about repentance. And you know what happened? He said, this is the best Bible study I ever had. I finally get it. I now understand. He couldn't understand sin. He couldn't understand repentance. So he's in this world and he's realizing his own problems are created by his own sin. And if he just was able to identify the ignorance in his life, he was able to turn it around. And he left so much full of faith. I said, here's a whole bunch of scriptures on sin. <laughs> go enjoy. <laughs> and I gave him some scriptures on repentance. And I go, go have it, you and the Lord. Go, go your way. I'll see you in two weeks, right? 
but I'd never seen him so happy. And I was like, he's so refreshed because I just told the truth. Not sugarcoating it, coating it, not being mean and nasty about it, not being holy in it now, but saying, this is the sin I see in your life. And it holds you back from God hearing you. You got to change it. What a difference that made. And so, Paul was able to explain to him what God wants from us. And so, we read this. Right before Eric comes up and gives us the communion. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by man, by the man he has appointed. And so he was able to explain why it's important for us to respond to him. He didn't hide back. Judgment comes. It is a real thing. Some don't believe it. Some don't believe in an afterlife. It doesn't matter. Whether they're Stoics, Epicureans, or Babblers, okay? Whether they're the Supreme Court. It doesn't matter. The message, the outline stays the same to whoever we are speaking to. Who God is. What God does, what God cares about, who we are in relationship to Him, what God wants from us, why is it important for us to respond to Him? You know, and there's something we have to realize. It continues on. In verse 32, 31, for it says, He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead, right? And when he heard about the resurrection of the dead, see, the, Are- the Areopagus was established, and one of the core beliefs in this establishment was there is no afterlife. So all of a sudden, Paul comes and says, yes, there is. It's been proven by the resurrection of Christ, of Jesus. So this is where the problem happens. And there are many, more than not, in this culture that looks at this message and say, that is foolish. In fact, they say, it's stupid. And so are you. But that does not matter. Our job is only to share the message. It's not to create a response. That is God's doing. But we cannot hold back what is necessary for them to know. When they heard this about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. I have this whole massive group of people. Only a select few got it. Do you understand? Just a few. And we get so discouraged because we get more no's than yay's. Well, that fits the narrative. That's how it is going to be. And guess what? In the best of times, it's still how it will be. More no's than yay's. But our job only, church, is to simply deliver the message. So I want to encourage you not to hold it back. But deliver it. You know, I want to ask you also for Wednesday is read Acts 14, verses 15 through 17. And the reason why is I want you to take what I just gave you and fit it into those scriptures. You can see the pattern Paul has laid out for us. How do you tackle Athens in the American hearts? You simply stick to the pattern that the scriptures have laid out for us. Your package may be different because you're going to talk about in cultural metaphors and ideas that we un- they only understand today. But the truth of the matter is you still got to communicate who God is, what he expects from us, right? Who we are in relationship to him, and, and the simple principles that Paul is laying out. That is the job of us, church. Nothing more, nothing less. And remember that his word will not be without effect. It will do its job. For us, it's to become all things to all people and live the life. Live it right. And that's all we got, folks. Amen. Amen.